Okay, good evening, everyone. So today we'll be covering 7.7 .7 on approximate integration. We've learned all the integration methods by U subs and by integration by parts, even by partial fractions, gives us these exact antiderivatives. Now we're talking about integrals, but those methods will not work, and we can just approximate you know, definite integrals um, using one of these methods. The midpoint rule, the trapezoidal rule, the Simpsons rule. You might be very familiar with the midpoint rule if you did Riemann sums and uh, Chapman calculus one. It's the same method, but they still come back and talk about it in a second. Um, we'll talk about air bounds, just to see you know, how accurate you could be in terms of decimal places. So, Let's start with the integral of some function we're actually familiar with. How about the square root of x? Let's just start with that. Let's just go from 0 to 4. We know how to get that exactly right. So in the end, we can just check our error in this problem to see how far away we are with the methods. We'll start with the midpoint method. So we're going to use the midpoint method or the midpoint rule. Midpoint rule means you build rectangles. You will build rectangles. Rectangles under that curve. Um, and um, it's a Riemann sum. But you have to be told how many rectangles to make. How about let's use n equals 2? So that n value, when I talk about this n value here, and you see, even see it in the formulas, think about like how many subdivisions you'll have, how many rectangles you'll actually build. We're talking about trapezoids. We're talking about how many trapezoids we'll have, right? Um, so in this case, let's look at this. We're going to use the midpoint rule. Let's draw a picture of this curve. Square of x, one, two, three, four. When you get out the four, it only gets up to two, right? This curve just kind of goes like that. We'll just go out that far. We're going to estimate that integral. Make this definite integral. We'll start with the midpoint rule, n equals 2. So, um, midpoint rule means we have rectangles. So, how many rectangles do I build inside the interval from 0 to 4? Two of them. So, it looks like we'll have one right here where there's the base. I'll make the height, and there'll be another one right here where that's the base and that's the height, right? So, to build the, the rectangles, Use the midpoint of the first subdivision. So this is a 1, that's a 2, that's a 3, that's a 4. Does everyone agree if I'm doing a midpoint rule? What's the midpoint value right there? Of the first subdivision of this first rectangle, 1. What you do is you draw a vertical line and you stop when you hit the curve. This is your height. And you're going to cut left and you'll cut right over that whole subdivision. And you'll see your rectangle. So we're doing this one by hand. To give you a sense of what's going on with this problem. So there's the first rectangle. I think it's some one value, right? You can read, you plug a one into the square root of x, you get one. So I just want to make this better to scale there. One, there's two. Get that up there. All right. I'm gonna build that first right down. Up there, stop, cut over, cut left, cut right. So obviously you got an overlap, but you also have an underestimated portion there. Does everyone see that in that first subject? <coughs> cool. That happens a lot with the midpoint. But it kind of evens out. It's not a bad rule. It's not a, a bad approximation method. You had an overlap, underlap. And it basically kind of, you know, an approximation. And then the second one, I'm going to do the same thing. Start up here. Stop. I hit the curve. I cut left. I cut right. True? Make my roof. So I want you to actually visualize these rectangles. This is the midpoint. And this is what it looks like when we're just doing a simple. Hey, two rectangles of y equals square root of x from 0 to 4. And uh, all we do is get the area of that rectangle, the area of that rectangle, and we add the areas together, right? 
That's the midpoint rule. I mean, look, look at the formula here. You might ignore this, but that's what's going on here. The change in x comes out of this formula. They say go b minus a over n. Well, what was n equal to in this problem? 2. That's the b, that's the a, so we can do that. What's, what's b minus a over n? What's 4 over 2? 2. But obviously you're like, oh, I know what it means when it says n equals 2. I built how many rectangles? 2. So you might not even need this, to be honest, when you read this stuff. This x bar there, they're just talking about, you know, take the average point right there between these two, the mean, which would be the middle point. Hey, let's just see what we get. Um, I think I can just do length times width plus length times width, right? For this method. That width is 2. In fact, the width of the second rectangle is 2. What's the length? 4. 1. You know, I'm going to write it as a square root of 1. Do you all agree to get this actual ADR? I have to plug a 1 into that formula. Even though you all know the square root of 1 is 1, I'm going to write square root of 1 there. And then what will this be? Root 3. Root 3. He takes the 3, he plugs it into the equation, and gets root 3. And you can apply this to any of multiple problems in this section. I mean, it might be sine of x squared. You might go, okay, I'll take the sine of 3 and then I'll square. That would be my height. Height would be the value of that function. Hey, uh, so what do we get out of this? I'm going to use a calculator on what's 2 plus 2 root 3. Root 3 is about 1.7. So I'm thinking, everyone, here's me in my head. 1.7, you multiply 2, that's about 3.4-ish. Hit it on your calculator. Is it about 5.4? Or 5.46. Oh, cool. 5.46. Cool. But we know how to get this exactly, don't we? Cool. So now, if you were curious on this problem by the midpoint rule, you know, you could find out exactly what this is and see if this is more than or less than that. We'll do that in a second. But I want to use the trapezoid rule. Was everyone okay with this? Cool. We'll remember this, everyone. We got 5.46 by using the midpoint rule as an estimate to the area under that curve, right? As an estimate to the Definite Let's do the trapezoid rule now. The trapezoids, we're going to build trapezoids, although they're going to look like on the side. A trapezoid, if you don't know, is a, a four-sided figure. Right? It's a four-sided figure where two sides are parallel to each other, the opposite sides. They call them the bases. Although the base is going to be up on our sides here, right? So that's what a trapezoid is. It's got four sides to the figure. Two sides are parallel to each other. We call them the bases. For two sides, don't have to be parallel. To each other. These do not have to be isosceles trapezoids or anything. Just trapezoids. So let's use the trapezoidal rule. I'll erase this entire picture, draw it again. We recall we got 5.46 with the midpoint rule, right? Yeah, I'll write that down. We got 5.46 n equals 2 with the midpoint rule. Huh? I'll just leave that. Well, let's use the trapezoidal rule. Of the track. And let's use n equal to 4. We can definitely put four trapezoids in that region, right? And yes, the problems they present that to you. Let me draw this again. One, two, three, four. When we start this section, boy, it really helps where we can actually <coughs> visualize the rectangles by the midpoint method for the, the trapezoids. Hey, keep in mind, both these curves I'm doing, it's the same curve, went above the x-axis. If you're curious, well, what if it did below the x-axis? Like the sine curve, doesn't it go below the x-axis for a period of time? We build our rectangles downward. That's okay. And then the f of x value, the y value, would be a negative value, wouldn't it? That's all. Because we know, can't definite integrals come out to be negative values and zero? So I just want to point that out if anyone wanted to see that. Let me turn you off. I know the two examples here, I got them going in the positive first quadrant. X and y are both positive. All right, we're going to build trapezoids. So what will this look like? And we're going to use n equals 4 
to estimate this definite integral. Look at draw. There's a base. There's a base. Uh, but there's that other side. I want to see a little gap in there. A little open space. Underestimate or overestimate? Brilliant. That's why I want you to draw a picture sometimes. So you can just go, hey, is this an underestimate or overestimate? You can see it. Slightly underestimated. It's going to happen throughout this whole portion. Isn't it? Look at this. It's going to be slightly underestimated. There's a curve bending right over that straight line. But boy, this should do a decent job. We're only building four of them. Theoretically, we should build an infinite amount, huh? Hey, this turns into a triangle, doesn't it? That's all right. Okay. So, this is a one, this is a two, this is a three, this is a four. Now, we're not talking about that form over there, we'll build it. Does anybody know the area of a trapezoid? The like area of a triangle is what, half base height? The area of a circle, pi r squared? What's the area of a trapezoid? Go back to geometry class. One half times the base times the parentheses, the first height plus the second. So one half times the height times the sum of the bases. This gives the area of a trapezoid. Any trapezoid, one half the height times the sum of the bases. Very good. One half the height times the sum of the bases. So we got to do four of these, don't we? Well, let's do it. Let's do it all out. One of these for this one. 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 Add up the four areas. We're going to have the estimation by the trapezoid rule. And when we're done, we can go back and reflect on that formula over there. And you might find that formula helpful. See all those twos in there? Like we're, we got, we must be curious. Where, where are all these funny twos coming from? And we're going to see. We're going to see where these come from. So now let's do one half height times the sum of the bases for each one of these. Well, I'll start with the first one. The height is on the side, right? You got to look at it like that. So what's that height? One. We got to think. What's the length of that base? It's a goofy zero. question. It's zero. And what's the length of that base? One. one. So I'm going to write for trapezoid <coughs> one. Here it is. I'll just draw you trapezoid one. I get I get one half the height times the sum of the bases. Two plus the length of one. Okay. I'll put a plus. I'll make this bigger. I'll make sure it's one half the height times the sum of the bases. Zero plus the square root of one. I can put square root of zero too if it helps. All right, those are the lengths. One half the height times some of the bases. Think the height's on the side. All right, how about trapezoid two? That was the first one. All right, here's the second one. One half the, what's the height? Oh, it's still one, cool. It's gonna happen on each one. What's the sum of the bases of? Root one plus root two. Root two? Halfway there. One half the height of the next trapezoid times the sum of the bases. Root two plus root three. I'm going to have to be trapezoid three. There's those two lengths right there. That's the, the bases I'm talking about on the side, the parallel sides. And the last trapezoid, one half the height times the sum of the bases. Root three plus root three. Add all this up, and we'll get it. But there are things you can factor out, like the what? The one half. We can factor out the height. But um, do you notice something while we're doing all this math? We're going to get the answer. How many times did this happen? Twice. Twice. And how many times? How many times did this happen? Twice. Finally, how many times did this square root of 3 happen? Twice. But at the end point, there was a lonely just square root 0. And at the right end point, there was just a lonely square root of 4. So now you get an idea of this formula and how it's derived. This one didn't have a 2, right? <coughs> f of x of 0. And then the f of x of n in the formula, 
has a coefficient of 1. But all the others have a coefficient of 1, 2. That's what that math form was saying. You're going to have two of these and two of these. We're going to build 100 of these trapezoids. That's what would have happened. Two, two, and two, and two, and two, and two, and two. But you would have had this lonely just one at the beginning and one at the end. So most students just go, oh, and they find it easy to remember the trapezoid rule. But if you ever blanked out on that thing, can't you just build a few trapezoids? You know, they sometimes they ask you to make eight of them or six of them. Hey, uh, anybody get this? 5.146. 5. 5.146. 5.146. Anybody else get this? Yeah? I'm going to write this down. 5.146, we use which method? Trapezoid rule. Nice. Yeah, the next time we do trapezoid rule, we'll all the other way. We'll just run through this. Right? We'll be able to look at this and just go two, 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 two. I just want to do it right here. Okay. Hey, I was wondering if we could do something. Can we find the exact area just to see how close these were? So, uh, what's the exact answer? How many of you see what the errors are? Close with these. I mean, we only used four. What's the exact? What's that antiderivative? X to the three halves over three halves means what? Two thirds. X to the three halves. All right. Plug in at four and subtract zero. Remember, four to the three halves means square root of four cubed. You probably didn't know. Eight. Probably do this in your head. 16, 16 thirds. You could probably do that in your head. How many times is 3 going to 16? 5.1. 5 and a third. So this is exact. I'm going to put an equal sign. No, no squiggle, right? On these, you're like, okay, about, about. But this is exact. So isn't it interesting? Which one was the overestimate? Midpoint. Which one was an underestimate? Trapezoidal rule. We expected that, though, didn't we? We saw that. We saw it kept ten and in overlap. If you're curious, this always happens. Was that graph concave up or concave down? Yeah, so if you're curious on a region that's concave down, did you know that always happens where I'll put a concave down that you know I'll put I for exact integral. But the midpoint method will always be I'll take it in all that. Greater than the actual integral value if it's concave down. And the trapezoidal rule will be flight underestimate, with the integral being the middle, if you're curious. Hey, do you remember the left and right Riemann sums? Remember those? Well, if you looked at that curve, can we just start with a right Riemann sum, if you're just curious? A right Riemann sum right here. That would be a right Riemann sum. Now these Underestimates or overestimates? Over. Over. So if you're curious, I can do this. R sub n here for right Riemann sum would be greater than the midpoint method. But the exact, there's the exact answer, the exact integral. With the trapezoidal method giving us that slight underestimation, and then I'll put L for left Riemann sum. Do you remember what a left Riemann sum was? You made rectangles, but you used the left side. So look at those rectangles. I and mean, here's what a left Riemann sum would look like. A left Riemann sum. See, that was in Calc 1, so we're not going to do the left and Riemann, right, Riemann sum now. But if you built like rectangles using the left Riemann sum, do you notice you get out of your estimates? You go up to the curve, and you stop, and you cut over. You go up to the curve, and you stop, and you cut over. But this really gives you an idea if a graph is concave down, what would happen? There's your exact answer. Midpoint would be a little bit greater. Trapezoid would be a little less. Now, what if it was concave up? It's concave up, you'd have these two switching around. And I should say if the graph's increasing, then you take those last ones. But if you're just curious about that, you can see it. Hey, one more in this problem. Then we'll wrench into some other ones. Let's apply 
another approximation method. Let's use Simpson's rule. Now Simpson's rule, everyone, we're just going to use the formula. Uh, if you want to know the, the derivation of that, like the proof of that is in a textbook. But I would put this in your notes. Trapezoidal rule uses trapezoids, right? Midpoint rule uses rectangles. Simpson's rule uses parabolas. It uses parabolas to get that area underneath it. All right? So that's what makes it a more and more challenging proof. But it is in the textbook if you want to read about it. Um, yeah, I should tell you the page, too. Where was Simpson's rule actually derived? Page 512. I mean, it took a full page, but it's interesting just to read about it. Like, how you, because look, look at this carefully. When I mean, here's the formula, this looks just like trapezoidal rule, except not changing x over 2, but changing x over what? A 3. This still has nothing as the coefficient, or 1 as the coefficient. The endpoint has a 1 as the coefficient. But rather than doing a 2, and then a 2, and then a 2 for all the middle values, it alternates between a 4 and a 2. And something else to note about the Simpson's rule, this wasn't the case with trapezoidal rule. n must be even. Okay, so n must be an even amount. Like, we're going to use 8 subdivisions. Or 10 subdivisions. We can't use 7 or 9. So how about let's use Simpson's rule, n equals 4, to estimate that. This is a great <laughs> method. Um, if you heard of computer algebra systems, which was mentioned in section 7.6, computer algebra systems like a TI-89 or Maple, etc. TI-Inspire, some of those use, those computer algebra systems use Simpson's rule to approximate definite integrals. Some of them do. This is a cool one. All right, n, n equals 4. We'll see how close this comes to the exact. What was exact again? 5.3? Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Is this close to these two? Because to get an error, don't we just subtract? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to use Simpson's rule. We won't draw a picture this time. Change in x over 3. I'm going to do f of x sub 0 plus 4 times the next one, plus a 2 times the next one, and you know, just keep doing this, alternate between a 4 and a 2 and a 4 and a 2 and a 4 and a 2. The second to last number will be, have a 4 as the coefficient, and then the very last number won't have a 4 or 2 as the coefficient, only have a 1, right? And we're going from 0 to 1. 1, 2, 3, 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, there's a formula for this change in x. Let's say this change in x here. Since we're now using a formula, we've got to understand exactly what that is. It is b minus a over n. So if you want to do the math, what's b minus a over n? What's 4 minus 0 over 4? 1. But if it helps, I think you can see what change in x is. Change in x is the width of each one of these subdivisions. You know, I'll say that a few times, because I don't want you to think, sometimes the errors, people go, oh, change in x here, and they put a 4. They think change in x is the entire region. No, change in x in this math form has a specific math form for all three of these. It's b minus a over n. But, so you're not confused. Look at the image and go, well, it's the width. Change in x just the width of these sub, just a 1, right? So this change in x problem is just a 1. That's a 3. And when plugging 0 into this, the function is going to be f x equal to what? Square root of x. It's going to still go up like this. Well, plugging a 0, what do you get? 4 times f of, uh, what's? 1 plugged into the function. Square root of 1. Plus 2 times square root of 2. Plus 4 times the square root of 3. And lastly, what do we get? Just root. I put a parentheses here, you don't have to. I think I'll rewrite that so it looks so sloppy. So and see how the 4 starts with the 4? 
and then always end with a four as the second to last or the penultimate term. Penultimate means second to last. So your second to last term, your penultimate term, will always have four as the coefficient to that value. Four times the function's value. The second one will always have four times the function value as you're going from left to right. And I'll let you do all the math and we'll see what we get. Whatever one third times the sum is. Simpson's rule is pretty daggone good though. See if you did better than trapezoid rule. Five point two five. I'll squiggle. We got the integral to be approximately five point two five by Simpson's rule. Cool. Hey, is this closer than this side? You no, know, we can always say I'm going to take the exact integral, <coughs> right? We subtract the what approximate, we can get that area. And that sometimes can be negative. All right, 5.33 minus, what was this? 5.25, what's that about? 0.08? Not bad with only n equal to 4. Could I use n equal to 100? Yeah, because it's even. But, uh, boy, it would be a lot easier with maybe Microsoft Excel or computer. Because doing that by hand on a TID4 would take forever, right? Right. He's trying to find it all on that front screen. Cool. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Awesome, Kate. So, with the end answer, would we have to include the error? No, unless they ask for it. Um, Unless they ask for it in a problem. These problems, when you hear error, they're usually going to ask you to, to talk about the error bounds in the problem when you're reading through them. And that's going to be really cool because we're going to say, okay, these are approximation methods. This stuff's pretty neat because we're saying, okay, we got a, we got approximation methods. We got computers here. We got calculators. We can estimate any definite integral. Just build enough of these, right? The more you build, right, you can get an infinite amount of what? Trapezoids or rectangles in there? But, um, it also takes a lot of time. So we want like a cutoff point to say, we want to limit the amount of what iterations a program has to run through to get to a desired accuracy. And so that's where we can use this. You can program that into a computer. And say, hey, once it hits this n equals 12 value for 12 terms, it should be accurate to maybe five decimal places. So great question. You don't have to show, feel free to do it though if you're curious yourself. Because it might be a problem that we can't do the integral of like you and I by hand. Like, we know u sub method. What else do we know? We know uh, integration by parts, and we know partial fractions. Okay, trig substitution, right? But you might look at the problem going, hey, none of those methods are working. So I'm going to have to, but we could use the uh, the calculator to use the um, to run a definite integral. And those calculators, perhaps it's using Simpson's rule, right? I can't guarantee the TID4 is using Simpson's rule, but. They also use this other approximation methods. I bet you a lot of people in this class are going to take numerical analysis, take that math course. It's, it's awesome. But you get to talk about other approximation techniques in terms of approximating this stuff. But these, these are fabulous. You, you'll see those in that course, though. You'll see Simpson's rule again. You'll see trapezoid rule again. Absolutely. Hey, uh, let's try another one. Let's try something that we're not familiar with in terms of, oh, uh, that's an easy integral. Just, Something where this would apply. How about zero to one? Sine x squared. Let's just can we do this one? And uh, I'm going to pick one of the three. How about let's do um, let's do trapezoidal. Rule. Use the trapezoidal rule. Okay, this is like number. <clears throat> from 7.7. This is like number 3, except number 3 they use cosine x squared. How about let's use trapezoidal rule n equals 1. By the way, if you want to write that, you can write that as like t sub 4. 
T for trapezoidal, four subdivisions if you want to write it like that in your notes. That's what you're using to estimate this. So you're going to use trapezoidal rule to estimate that definite interval. I wanted to do this a few times with you, different methods, different integrals. Maybe read it from a table, and then we'll work about. We'll talk about the error bounds. Uh, I chose this problem for a reason. This is like number three. Does the U sub work here? Integration by parts, partial fractions, trig substitution. None of those methods are going to work. But we're going to approximate this definite integral by trapezoidal rule. Hey. If you want to examine this with the calculator, just the graph, it's not a bad idea just to see if it's concave up or concave down. You can kind of predict whether or not we're going to have like an error less than or greater than. On the test, are you going to like tell us which method to use? Yes, to use great to use question. Um, they, you'll be asked which method to use. Now, sometimes I'm just, usually the problems like this, they have to tell you how many self-divisions. Because okay. Connor might be like, what do you want me to use, 100? <laughs> Seriously. You'd be like, they can put a hundred of these and take forever. Or 12 or something like this, or 16. So those will be very specific. N equals 4. they got to tell you subdivisions. When they give you a table, and I'll make sure we're going to do that very soon. I'm going to give you a table out of the book. A table values, or recordings. In actual life, people sometimes just get data and they want to approximate what's going on. Perhaps they're getting a bunch of velocities. They want to estimate the distance that a rocket travels. But... On those problems, we're always going to use the most subdivisions we can. So let me say that again. If you're given a table, they don't give you this n equals 4 sums. You go, what am I going to use? You're going to make, you're going to use the data you got and use as many subdivisions as you can. Which means you'll just keep making that change in x go by whatever you have in, those, in the table. If it's going by 3s or going by 6s for the x values. Hey, uh, this graph, it's sine of x, y equals sine of x squared. Kind of concave up. Kind of looks like this. It's not that steep. Um, if you want to look at it, feel free to put that in your calculator. Yeah, and you can use what, 0 to 1? See the window? If we hit, hit 0 to 1, it would just be like. The, the zoom. Zero if it's the entire function. Nice. But I looks like it's concave up over the region. Just so we can apply that. Remember that one was concave down? So hey, um, trapezoid, just so we can estimate it. I mean, a trapezoid like this, just look at that. Overestimate or underestimate? It's overestimating, isn't it? If the graph is concave up over the entire region, as well, it looks like we're going to get an overestimate with the trapezoidal method. Just something we can, you know, observe, and then we can perhaps hit this on our calculator, use the 